Good day, Justin Miller, Rockstar College Physics here. I'm going to start turning up the temperature, so to say. Just start looking at some thermodynamics here. So it's kind of the intro to thermo. And what is thermodynamics? Oh, it's study of objects interacting of different temperatures, how temperatures change, how energy crosses boundaries, how things may expand or contract due to temperature changes. All sorts of things are correlated with thermodynamics. But what we want to stick with is just some, some basic definitions at this point and start to get into some more elaborate ideas here as time goes on. But that's what we want to start looking at. Thermal processes, processes that involve changes in temperature and or changes or exchanges of thermal energy. So in order to start talking about changes in temperature, we've got to understand what is temperature, right? Say, well, if it's a characterization of whether something's hot or whether something's cold. And yeah, that's, that's true to, to a degree. I get it, a degree. Never mind. Anyways, well, yeah, something's hot, something's cold. But how do we, how do we judge that? We say, well, we can touch it. Feels hot, it's hot. Feels cold, it's cold. Say, well, that's not really a good way of doing things because our senses can be confusing at times. So say, oh, well, we use a thermometer. I say, yeah, thermometers are good. So how do thermometers work? And well, there's all sorts of different thermometers, but you take your basic alcohol or mercury thermometer and say, well, you got some change in the volume of some liquid due to it increasing or decreasing in, temp in, in its temperature, and it reads off its temperature. So yeah, that sounds, sounds pretty reasonable, but how's it all gauged, right? <clears throat> What is temperature really due to? So these are some questions that we want to be able to answer and start to get some aspects of thermodynamics so that we can expand on it and figure some stuff out. All right, so temperature. We've got some ways of talking about temperature, right? We've got, oh, we can talk about degrees Fahrenheit, talk about degrees Celsius, Maybe even talk about some Kelvin. Could. These are just scales, right? Scales of a way to say how hot or cold something is. So we start off with this. We've got ourselves Celsius scale. Celsius scale is nice. And ultimately, we have a nice zero point that is defined as the freezing point of water liquid water at one atmosphere, atmospheric pressure, will freeze at zero degrees Celsius. And same water at atmospheric pressure will boil at 100 degrees Celsius. So then we take that and say, well, in between the zero and 100, there's little hash marks, so to say, and we got ourselves a thermometer. And then we could go below zero or over 100 with even increments. That's good. So we've got our way of gauging how hot something is based upon Celsius. We can also do the same thing with Fahrenheit, just a different scale. You say, well, no, wait. Actually, water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and it boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit for whatever reason. You say, okay, that's good. That's good too. That's another scale that we could use. But uh, is there one? One of those better than the other? The answer is no, they're just two scales. One's maybe a little bit better, but that's, a, that's what we want to start getting at, is what are we going to use here? Is there SI units for temperature? And there are some other characterizations of temperature. So, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's pretty much common knowledge. Yeah, water freezes, water boils, and we use our temperature scales in order to utilize that, but there's one other scale that is really, really significant, and that is Kelvin scale for measuring temperature. So it turns out that temperature is really directly connected with the motion of the molecules of which object or substance is composed of that you're measuring. The more vigorously that 
of the atoms or molecules move around, whether they're vibrating back and forth or moving around in a gas, the more vigorous that is, the hotter something is. Temperature itself is directly connected with molecular motion. Quicker motion, on average, higher temperatures. So we get this Kelvin scale because we see that as things start getting colder and colder, the molecular motion of their composite molecules or atoms start slowing down until they stop moving completely, motionless. And that is very significant. That happens at what is known as absolute zero. So, the Kelvin scale for measuring temperature has an absolute zero point. At absolute zero. All molecular motion ceases. And as things get hotter and hotter, above absolute zero, the motions get more vigorous, so to say. So this is nice because, as we'll see later on, that hey, for an absolute zero, no motion of, of the particles or molecules of which the substance composed, it has some other consequences itself. But this is it. This is a nice scale because it does have this absolute zero. And Kelvin scale is incremented the same as the Celsius scale. means that a change in Kelvin is equal to a change in Celsius. Delta Kelvin is equal to delta degrees Celsius. So a change of one Kelvin is equivalent to a change of one degree Celsius. So that's something nice. And we can make some other correlations with this. And that is that zero Kelvin is equal to 207, excuse me, negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. That is absolute zero right there in Celsius. It's pretty cool. Yes, it is. There we go. We've got that. Well, then we can start doing things maybe a little bit more familiar for us in the United States. And they say, well, what about Fahrenheit? That's what I'm used to, right? I don't like Celsius. I don't really use Celsius. So we've got conversion factors between Celsius and Fahrenheit. That's pretty straightforward here. For conversions between Fahrenheit, maybe spelled wrong too. <laughs> is SIUS. That looks more correct to me. That, I believe, is wrong. That's okay. We have temperature and Fahrenheit, T sub F, we'll say, is equal to 9 fifths times the temperature in Celsius plus 32 T sub F equals the temp in degrees Fahrenheit. T sub C is equal to the temp in degrees C. So you can see if we go, hey, zero degrees Celsius, that goes to zero, hey, that's 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And we can start playing around with that and see, oh yeah, that makes sense. 
And we could also invert this. We could subtract 32 from both sides and then multiply it by 5 ninths. And we can say that T sub C, the temperature in Celsius, is equal to 5 ninths, the quantity of the temperature in Fahrenheit minus 32. And we can always go back to this correlation with degrees Kelvin and start figuring out, excuse me, I shouldn't say degrees Kelvin, just Kelvin. No degrees there, just Kelvin. We'll figure out what degree Fahrenheit is zero Kelvin. It's in the 400s, negative 400s. Anyways, that's what we've got. So we've got some temperature scales, and we're going to use Kelvin as the SI unit. But we'll note that a lot of times we can still utilize Celsius because if we're looking at a change in temperature, they're equivalent. Change in Kelvin versus a change in degrees Celsius. So that's important. But if we're just utilizing a temperature, we want to use SI units, we want to use Kelvin. All right, so we've got some other things to discuss other than just temperature, and that is some notions of what can happen between objects. So there's what is known as the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Zeroth. Ooh. I've heard of first laws. The only zeroth I've ever heard of is this one. If they came up with the first and second laws first and then said the zeroth is more fundamental, or something's more fundamental, so they said, better call it the zeroth then. I don't know why they did that, but we'll just go ahead and say, hey, there's the zeroth law. This is where we start out. And what does the zeroth law say? Well, this says some things that we're going to have to define, but it says this. If object A is in equilibrium, thermal equilibrium, say. with object C and object B is in thermal equilibrium with object C, then object A and B are at the same temperature. So what this actually brings up is the idea of what is thermal equilibrium and how can we achieve it. So that begs the question to be answered, like, okay, what is thermal equilibrium? And I say, well, that's when two objects are at the same temperature. It's a little bit more than that. Two objects. said to be in thermal equilibrium they are in thermal contact thermal energy. Okay, so they're in thermal contact, they don't exchange any thermal energy, then they're in thermal equilibrium. 
Well, that brings up some other things like, hey, what is thermal contact then? And what do you mean there's no net exchange of thermal energy? So we go ahead and say thermal contact. Two objects are said to be in thermal contact. Change thermal energy. Okay, now we've got something about all coming down to thermal energy here. That's the end point here. So what is thermal energy? is the kinetic and potential energies kinetic and potential energies on a molecular level that ultimately substantiate what thermal energy is. And when we have objects that are in thermal contact, they can exchange that thermal energy. So this goes back to something I was talking about, molecular motion of particles or the molecules of which something's composed is directly correlated with its temperature. Things vibrate, move around at rapid rates, relative to slower rates, hey, it's hotter relative to colder. And when they're in thermal contact, two objects are in thermal contact, we can find that the molecular motion of one object can affect the molecular motion of the other's object. And we have this energy exchange. And that energy exchange ceases, or at least the net energy exchange ceases, once the objects are in thermal equilibrium. And if they're in thermal equilibrium, that means they're at the same temperature. So it all kind of flows back there. That's what we've got with the zeroth law. It's really used to define the, the aspects of thermal contact and thermal energy and thermal equilibrium. All right, so these are some aspects or some notions that we want to be studying in thermodynamics. So, Good law. I like it. Zero law. Who would have thought? All right. So, where do we go from here? Well, again, there's a lot of stuff going on with thermodynamics. We're just going to kind of look at broad, generalized ideas, but ideas in the West. So, let's talk about the first one called thermal expansion. Thermal expansion as a substance or object changes temperature. In substance or object, we should limit ourselves here to. Let's say why we're limiting ourselves to that momentarily. Because the substance or object changes temperature. There is a tendency of it to also change. 
change. dimensional aspects. And by that we mean like length, area, volume. So the reason that we don't want to talk about a gas in this particular case is because the volume of a gas is really dictated by what is containing that gas. You let a gas out, it fills up the volume that's available to it, spreads itself out. So we don't want to just say, oh, well, we've got thermal expansion of gases. There's other things that happen with gases. But definitely with solids and liquids, this is something that's quantifiable and easy to, should I say easy to see? Can be easy to see, depends on the situation. But it's a very important thing to be able to start taking into account, especially when you start engineering things. And, well, hey, if you don't take into account the temperature differences that the object's going to undergo, the extremes, the highest high and the lowest low, don't account for those, and the expansion and contraction of that material, bad things can happen, or just things that you don't want to happen. Um, you think about building a bridge, building a bridge in some area that undergoes pretty large changes in temperature. During the summer, it gets 115 degrees. During the winter, it gets negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. The pretty big temperature changes. Well, depending on what you're building this bridge of, that material is going to undergo some sort of expansion when it's hot and some sort of contraction when it's cold, comparative to when it's just a regular nice temperature out. Anyways, if you don't have that considered in your design of the bridge when you build it, then what can happen? Well, in the summer when it gets really hot, you can have that the structure of the bridge can start putting internal forces on other components of the bridge and it can buckle. That's no good. That could be very bad. Or in the winter, it can sort of contract. And again, if it contracts too much, we have these buttresses and different trusses and things. You can put forces on those that may overcome the structural integrity of the bridge and again, collapse. Skyscrapers, railroad tracks, all sorts of things. The sidewalk that you walk on needs to have some consideration of temperature differences that it may undergo and the, the extent of the expansion and contraction that it will then undergo as well. Sometimes you gotta learn the hard way, but Hopefully not at the expenditure of people's well-being. At any rate, what we want to get the idea of is why do things contract or expand? And the simplest thing to look at is first case of just length, where we take some object that's only in one dimension and think about it. What's the object composed of? And let's even talk about a solid object. What's the object composed of? We've got some rod here. It's composed of a bunch of atoms, right? A bunch of atoms that you say, oh, well, they're really packed together because, well, it's heavy. And I say, well, they're average. They're actually separated. The molecules or atoms are separated by some amount in some sort of lattice here. And there's some average separation. And depending on the temperature that this is at, each atom is undergoing some little vibration, thermal vibration, and has an average separation from its neighbors. What happens when you start to heat up? this object. What happens as it gets hotter is those individual atoms' vibrations start being more vigorous, requiring larger spaces for it to take place, having larger amplitudes. What does that mean? Well, they kind of push their neighbors to the sides a little bit. On average, they have to occupy more space, and so do their neighbors, and their neighbors, and their neighbors. And what happens? Well, in order for that to take place, everything has got to move out a little bit. And though it may be a very little bit, it's, it's measurable. And it can have some impact. So what I generally do consider, consider, whew, 
one dimensional solid object composed of atoms equally separated. some initial temperature. Some initial temperature, T initial. So we have this object, and all that we need to look at is the atoms themselves. So this is kind of a, a huge exaggeration here. Typically the atoms are separated more like 10 to the negative 11 meters really, really small distances, but you just kind of take a little line of them. And each of these atoms is, since it's one dimensional, just oscillates back and forth in that one dimension. And I did this one, just a little bit more. This one, it goes back and forth like that. Alternate colors here. And this one, goes back and forth like that. This one goes back and forth like that. This one goes back and forth like that. This one goes back and forth like that. And this one goes back and forth like that. So each of these atoms is really bouncing back and forth in a sense. That's its equilibrium position. But sometimes it's over here, sometimes it's over here. This oscillates. It's like a little simple harmonic oscillator, in a sense. And, well, there has to be this sort of um, spacing right here between two adjacent atoms to allow them both to oscillate back and forth. What happens when this object, which is here at T initial, gets hotter? Increase temperature to T final and atoms have larger separations. So draw this out. somewhat evenly spaced here, but now, go like this, quicker for me. They need more room, right? Because they're vibrating back and forth more vigorously. What happens? Increase in length. By how much? Well, by this much. Larger, right? So we have for this one, we have, we could say, L initial, initial length. And for this one, we've got an L final, final length. I'll erase that little part there. So this was at T initial, this is at T final. And lastly, we've got ourselves this right here, from here to there. That is delta L, change in length. There we go. One sec. So what do we do with that? Well, we can write out a little expression. Um, this expression, not deriving it, it's a first order approximation from some higher level stuff. But ultimately, we can get a correlation between temperature change, change in length, and something about the material itself. So, we can write that L final is equal to alpha times L initial times T final minus T initial. Plus L initial. 
So what is all this? Well, if we can rearrange this a little bit, we can subtract L initial from both sides and write that delta L is equal to alpha L initial times, that's just delta T. Where delta L is the change in length due to change in temperature. Delta T. And what do we have in there? One more thing. Two L initials, the initial length. And alpha is called the coefficient of linear expansion. Which is a property of the material. Being used. That is to say, different materials have different coefficients of linear expansion. And generally, well, we define coefficients of linear expansion for solid types of material. For liquid, well, that's a little bit more difficult, but it's got volumes for liquids, right? So we get this. So we take steel, say, oh, this is how much it changes due to this temperature change, and we define the coefficient of linear expansion. Now, generally, this is really an average. Um, the coefficients of expansion have some temperature dependence to begin with, but over small, sufficiently small temperature changes, we can define just an alpha. For this course, we're just going to say, hey, this is the coefficient of linear expansion, and that's that. And, and understand that it is noted to be valid over the temperature changes being considered. Um, but truthfully, it does have some temperature dependence in it. Anyways, this is what we've got. Nice expression, easy to use, and that's it. So we can do the same sort of thing for area expansion, what would we have? Well, we'd have length expansion or contraction in two dimensions, this way and this way. So you can think of a sheet, a sheet of metal that undergoes changes in temperature. What happens? Well, it's going to expand in both dimensions. Now, generally, especially for metals, I shouldn't say especially for, but with materials that have sort of a grain in them, a direction of, of a grain, you'll find that there is variation in how much it expands one way versus the other. So sometimes you'll have coefficients of linear expansion that are different in different dimensions for, say, area expansion. But if we do have that the area expansion has the same linear expansions in both dimensions, then there's an easy correlation between the linear expansion and the area expansion. So let's just do this. For area expansion, or contraction, we can write delta A, the change in area, is equal to gamma times the initial area times delta T. Delta A, change in area, delta T, change in temperature, and A is an I, initial temperature, excuse me, initial area, 
and gamma. It's called the coefficient of area expansion. So that's regardless of whether it, it expands equally in both dimensions or not. We can still come up with some gamma that quantifies what the overall area change is. But if the linear expansion same in both dimensions, uh, gamma is equal to 2 times alpha. So if we're talking about a sheet of steel and we're assuming that it's going to expand um, or have the same sort of expansions per unit initial length in both dimensions, then write that. You can take the coefficient of linear expansion, multiply it by 2, and utilize that for the coefficient of area expansion. And then lastly, we can talk about volume, which would apply to solids and liquids, and have volume expansion. Change in volume, delta V, is equal to, that's a beta, multiplied by the initial times delta T. Beta is called the coefficient of volume expansion. for substance beta is equal to free alpha. This, this is beta being a little tail there. Delta V change in volume. Initial, initial volume, and we already know what delta T is, the change in temperature. All right, so this is how we work things. Volume expansion, really important. Say you take some big steel drums, and you fill it up with some liquid, maybe some toxic liquid or very dangerous liquid, and you go stick it in your backyard. You seal it up, you stick it in your backyard, because you gotta store it somewhere, right? So what, do you, what happens? One day it gets really hot, really hot. You filled it up to the very top. Now the steel container, it's gonna expand. That's good. But the question is, does it expand enough? Because the liquid as a volume is gonna to expand too, due to it increasing its temperature. And if the liquid expands more than the container does, the volume that the container holds in, Guess what? That's right. It's going to start spilling out. And then you've got some big trouble. Big, big trouble. So those are some things that you've got to be able to consider when you're storing chemicals and such things. That's why you typically don't fill things up all the way, because hey, you may find that something undergoes some, some uh, thermal expansion. And in a lot of cases, you find that the 
liquid inside the container um, expands more than the container can accommodate if filled up all the way. So just another nice place. All right, so there we go, some expansion, thermal expansion. We have some more stuff to look at. We'll look at it in a bit. I think that's good for right now.